<laughs> I'm Katie. I'm Garrett. And as this comes out, this will come out on June 29th, but starting July 1st, you'll be able to nominate us for the People's Choice Podcast Award. So in the show notes for this episode, there'll be a link. And of course, we'll share it to our Instagram at the bar is ankle high. Just um, go and nominate us <laughs> so we can win an award because, <laughs> um, uh, well, we want to. And yep. um, <laughs> our self-esteem is entirely dependent on this award. <laughs> yeah, it's weird how much we require um, outside confirmation that we're the best ever Constant at positive that's feedback. ever been attempted. <laughs> and so we need it. So we're in the <laughs> comedy and health categories. <laughs> Of course. <laughs> so that's in the show notes. And we'll remind you again at the end of the episode. Um, but yeah, starting July 1st and for the whole month of July, you can nominate us um, for those categories. And then we'll find out if we made it past the nomination round and get to like actually be a part of the award ceremony or whatever the hell in September. So go do it. <laughs> It's like when you were telling people to sign up for Patreon and it got real threatening real quick. Yeah. Just sign up, guys. Or else. <laughs> A very mild suggestion. Mm. But today for the uh, last episode that we're releasing during Pride Month, uh, inspired by a post actually that was made by the neurodivergent nurse who you all heard on our feed a couple weeks ago, um, we are talking with Sarah Spellman. Um, she, they, one of our listeners and Patreon subscribers, but we are talking about the uh, queer experience within neurodivergent spaces or however else you want to describe that. So thank you so much for agreeing to do this and also yeah. coming up with the idea. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for having me. Like, it's funny because, like, my fiance had, like, made a joke of, like, oh, like, you should ask them to, like, be a, a guest, like, host on the show. And I was like, no way. Like, there's, <laughs> and then I, I said that as a joke. And then they're like, oh, they were serious. Okay, we're going to do this. Let's do this. And they're like, yeah, oh, that was cool. also, the whole interaction was a very ADHD interaction because I yes. was like, yeah, you can do that. And then you were like, ooh, are you serious? And I was like, <laughs> Yeah. Are you serious? Because <laughs> I don't know anymore. <laughs> and Katie and I are both like, yeah, okay. Yeah, let's let's do it. Like, and oh man, it was a joke. I didn't get it. <laughs> no, definitely, definitely glad to be here and doing this episode for sure. And I mean, like, what a time in present day America to be talking about neurodivergence and the queer community all in one go. <laughs> So hopefully we can stir up some angry comment threads and, you know, people can be upset that these, uh, you know, some of the stuff in my notes are definitely interesting statistics that I came across. Can um, being gay be cured with essential oils, though? Ooh, great question. Probably not. <laughs> oh, okay. I hear you're not <laughs> supposed to just ingest them, though. I feel like I heard that on some podcasts that I follow. Mm, that sounds you like can't fake just, news. You can't just, like, eat essential oils or, like, mix <laughs> it in with your Starbucks drinks. Imagine how bad it would taste. It'd be so I, I feel like it's got to taste like the inside of an old sneaker. Or, like, like it's probably, like, licking the inside of a done candle, you know? Yeah. Like, oh, Yeah. Yeah, like it's like, like just eating like, a candle warmer. Yeah, yeah, yeah probably, <laughs> probably. Like even if they told me like, hey, this would cure all of these woes that you have, I still wouldn't do it because I just wouldn't be able to like get it down. Yeah, my probably woes are not. my friends. <laughs> <laughs> what am I going to do with all these woes? <laughs> what, what am I just supposed to like them? do I'm chores be, now? <laughs> yeah, I'm supposed to be stress free. Yeah. That's <laughs> That's unlikely. I think my whole personality is my anxiety. What am I supposed to do? Just eat this candle warmer and then find a new personality? I don't know. Yeah. It's, like a, cool. it's like a Kit Kat. You just break off those squares. And oh, just... God. It would taste so bad. <laughs> yeah. Just no. Like, that's just and then a flavored just crayon. Like, yeah. No, or yeah. like, yeah, my tongue would end up with like a waxy film. Uh, nope. <laughs> Don't like that. Sorry. Don't Can like you tell that. Tell we all have sense. We all have sensory issues. <laughs> We're just like, mm, 
No. <laughs> what could I drink to get that flavor out of my mouth? <laughs> Don't like that. Anything, but as long as it's not hot, because then it's just going to melt the wax even more. So. Yeah. I can't tell if that would help or be worse. Yeah. So why are you talking to us about queerness with ADHD, Sarah? I mean, I know I said your pronouns are she, they, but. Yeah. So I probably started to come out to a lot of my friends maybe like a decade ago, which is like crazy to think about. I was still an undergrad. But I also feel like I've always been, like, after, especially after reading um, that post from the neurodivergent nurse, like, I feel like I never really, not only, like, connected the two of just, like, oh, I wonder if, like, my neurodivergence, like, ties into not only just, like, sexual orientation, but also, like, gender identity as a whole, but also just, like, the, you know, like, the dual stigma. I was like, wow, that that hits way too close to home because I feel like I've always been way more willing and capable and like open about my ADHD and like things like that but when it comes to like coming out constantly to like new people new co-workers that whole concept like I feel like there's definitely like a huge difference of being like hey I have ADHD and now I work here versus like hey I'm your new queer uh, employee. Sorry, my cat just woke up. Let's see. <laughs> no, no, he just needed to adjust. He's fine. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and so, like, then the more I talk to like a lot of my friends that are both neurodivergent and queer, they basically agreed like there is this like dual stigma, the the constant uh, having to deal with just like hostile environments and or you know, that just work and life is just more challenging in general. So I definitely wanted to, you know, be able to spread the knowledge and help bring uh, some of these issues to light of other people that might not know somebody who experienced these things and or, uh, you know, if they, if them themselves have been like questioning their identity and stuff like that. So definitely um, happy to be here. So when were you, two questions, when were you diagnosed with ADHD? Ooh, loaded question. So <laughs> I, it's like a two, that has like cool. a two part answer. <laughs> um, so I got, uh, when I was a freshman in high school, I was, I don't know how in depth some of this testing was. I feel like I don't really remember it. I got diagnosed in high school with um, mild to moderate ADHD never, never really sought out any type of real therapy, didn't choose to go on medication because I was a varsity athlete. And I saw that true life. I'm addicted to Adderall episode. And I was like, yeah. Oh, can't, can't do it. Can't, true life had can't. such a grip, such a grip. <laughs> you know, that would be a good one to rewatch is true life. Oh yeah. I bet that that is like, a wild look at the zeitgeist in the early aughts. Yeah. I feel like I did try to rewatch some of them and then they're just too cringy that I just had to turn it off. I couldn't, couldn't <laughs> do it. Some things don't need to be relived. Like it's not for the nostalgia at that point. Like, That's like the original trading spaces. Like I'd want to crawl right out of my skin. I absolutely loved it when I was younger, but oh, yeah. to watch that, the idea of somebody putting fucking hay on my walls <laughs> and being like, isn't it great? And like, being like, fuck no, it's not. Yeah. Fix my house. I thought the like, one how do you where even get that off? <laughs> MTV had that one where room writers oh, where they would go yeah. like, into yeah. your bedroom and like go through your shit hard pass. and at the time I was like oh I would watch it and now I'm like what oh I deranged. remember them like taking this girl's pants and underwear out and trying to figure out her body size based on her pants and underwear and I'm like mm -hmm. I want to like have a just a full spiral thinking that should about actually it. you guys doing a review of like MTV's like hit reality shows of like the 2000s dysfunction junction episode just gonna yeah. throw that oh, out there yeah, especially the dating one. shows that they the had like next the one, yeah was room raiders like, the one where they caught off the bus and was like Ew. next <laughs> he'd be like Never what mind, up i'm tom 
oh my god there were so many bad ones and like really bad flexes that they do like mm-hmm. as they were coming off the bus and the ridiculous up yeah all of that all of that so cringy all these men uh, just like loaded with like hpv just yes yeah they were hpv patient zero <laughs> hpv didn't use to cause cancer it did after those men were allowed to disseminate themselves after they became their own super spreaders <laughs> yes basically. <laughs> basically between that and like jersey shore they just created a new sti yes <laughs> somehow hpv and herpes created its own super bug with mm-hmm. these guys i i believe that you'll never shake it <laughs> I, I believe it you'll literally yeah. never get rid of it <laughs> and that's from the fox doctor garrett agrees <laughs> So anyway, back to why we're here. <laughs> mm. It's the afternoon. Uh, Meds have worn off. Yeah. Is that what it is? Huh? Um, For me. Right. So <laughs> I got, yeah, probably same. Um, I was diagnosed in high school, didn't do anything about it, um, lived my best life. So I thought, you know, got into uh, top choice college, did pretty good during undergrad, definitely looking back, probably not as good as I probably could have done if I was on medication back then. But then uh, I started grad school in 2017. I didn't do my full evaluation until 2019. So I was like halfway done with grad school, working full time. I was also like waitressing part time. Part of the time I was, yeah, I was exhausted. getting grad like going through grad school and I'm just like man I have like no energy for the weekends like I feel like I'm just getting through all the work that I like need to get done but then like I can't go out on a date on like a Saturday because I'm just so exhausted and my fiance was just like well maybe you should like try to go get like a full evaluation and like see if you can get on medication because like that might be what like you know makes that switch over and it's been great ever since basically uh nice yeah like like i'm just like man why didn't i do this sooner but (laughs) now like the rest of my 20s like went great i graduated with like honors during grad school like i got into an honor society which like i never thought would be possible for me like i like i told you on instagram i was not a pleasure to have in class (laughs) um especially because like my last name starts with an s so throughout all of elementary middle school and high school when you're put in alphabetical order i'm almost always sitting by the window Mm. like consistently mm. sitting yeah, in the back by the window mm. you know it's not a good place for a kid with adhd in the back and by the window Maybe either that's way why i didn't it. get it because i was an o so i was like always smack in the middle i was also an s so i was always like back by the window and in college would sit literally like front row. front row in the classroom yep. like <laughs> yep me too it was the only way I was able to mm-hmm. like really pull off good grades during undergrad is because I was like, "Ooh, I can sit in the front here. I never had that option before. And so I would literally just sit, do that. And it, it was a game changer because I definitely got way better grades in undergrad and grad school than I ever did all throughout like elementary, middle school and high school. And but, being able know, to control we, your own schedule too, I think made a huge that difference. Too. Yeah. And like being interested in like the classes that I was actually taking mm-hmm. definitely helped too. Weird how those things uh, work out. It's almost like <laughs> dopamine is playing a role in mm. brain function. Huh. I think you're full of shit. Weird. I think you made that up. <laughs> like some kind of frog doctor would do. <laughs> And so now I just try to just like educate myself on like all of the nuance of adult ADHD. And like, can I just say shout out to the two of you because your podcast, I've listened to so many ADHD podcasts and like so many times it's focused on like your parent with a kid with ADHD or like your, uh, you know, just other like too scientific or just too not captivating on the subject because so much of this stuff is so dense and like your podcast has been like a game changer i send it to so many people wow all the time all the time thanks yeah 
Because I'm just like, this is like a hot take of just like adults with ADHD (laughs) is like such, such a hard thing to come by. That's also like funny and entertaining. So like, if you don't get that, if you don't get it nominated for that award, I'm going to have to definitely go screw that some people. So don't worry. Oh, we'll just go into a full tailspin and spiral. Oh, no, 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 no. If I'll definitely. Yeah. This, what'll be fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, if we don't, um, my partner, PK, he um, just told me that he's surprising me with tickets to a pink concert for our anniversary, which is like the first week in August. So if, we'll find out by then if we're nominated or not, I think. And so then I can just spiral at a pink concert. <laughs> I mean, that seems like a great place to do that. I'm so excited. Yeah. 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 (laughs) I feel like I saw clips of her like uh, doing a rehearsal of that tour and I feel like it was really good. That's pretty much how it came about because I was like, man, I'd like love to see Pink live because I saw her when she was at the time at the Pepsi Arena um, and she was the opening act for NSYNC. And it was like when her first album had come out and she did like the whole soundtrack think, for Save the Last Dance. So I actually think my fiance might have been at that show. <laughs> I'm not Probably. gonna lie. I'm not gonna lie. But it I was feel- like, oh, I've oh, she was so cool. She was like running down the aisles and singing and oh it was probably just when awesome. she actually had her pink hair too. Yes, she had yeah. like bright, which I thought was the fucking coolest. And I couldn't understand as somebody with dark brown hair why I also couldn't have hot pink hair. Yeah. And my mom kept trying yeah. to explain to me, like, it won't show up. Like you'll have to bleach your hair to mm-hmm. oblivion and it's not gonna look cute. Mm-hmm. And uh not to mention like I don't know, even public schools in the late 90s and early 2000s, they were not Oh, your Catholic having... school was not going to allow that either. Oh, that was Garrett. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was no. in public school, but even then they were like, that's too distracting. Like, we, we couldn't wear spaghetti strap tank tops. We couldn't have short shorts unless you were thin. Um, and yeah, so it was just wild. So. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I loved it. And so I had said like, man, I'd really love to see – you know, her show. But then I like looked up tickets and I was like, oh, they're just really expensive. And like, it's either like at Fenway or it's city field. And so then it would be like an overnight trip. And so it like turns into this whole thing. So I was like, eh, forget it, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, you never talk about going (laughs) to like live music at all or any music really. Oh yeah, that's right. You're not a concert person. No. And so he was like, for you to mention that you wanted to go to a concert, (laughs) like I had to take it seriously. So at least I'll have that to console me if we don't get nominated. But that's so sweet. I'm so glad that you get something. Yeah, thank from you us. so much. I love. I that. was trying to describe yesterday <clears throat> to Jamie, um, the neurodivergent nurse, why people listen to our podcast, and I didn't have an answer. <laughs> Yeah, we literally were like, we don't know why. It's because so many <laughs> things are catered for like the parent kid relationship, or mm-hmm. just like it. They only talk about kids and or only talk about it in the male experience. I feel Mm -hmm. like a lot of the stuff that other people have also covered just doesn't even come close to like your hormone episodes or like the PMS episodes where it's just like, wow, never really thought about how my Adderall doesn't work like days leading up to that. Like, oh, it's not just me. It's not just because I'm lazy or tired. It's, oh, my brain chemistry is just completely Mm -hmm. off. And now I'm like, wow, I feel a little bit better about myself. Like, wow, I can't beat myself up because I don't want to do work for like three days. But it's just like, oh, Mm -hmm. it's not you. It's your Adderall not working. That's Mm -hmm. why it doesn't work. Right. And it's not, it's, it can lead to like this imposter syndrome of like, well, if my meds aren't working, then like maybe I'm faking it just to get this stimulant, which like is a ridiculous supposition, but it's so easy to go down that road. Um, And then, you know, you have this potentially, if you have PMDD, you know, two to three weeks leading up to this and that you're feeling like, well, shit, like I'm a failure. I can't do it even with this medication. Like, why am I so bad at this? <laughs> like, and it's just like, not your fault. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's literally nothing I could have done to prevent this and, or really change it. So we're just, we're just here for the ride at this point. But yeah, basically. Yeah. Um, but to your point of, uh, 
the imposter syndrome, that's actually a lot of the things that came up during my research for this episode. That part of working while uh, queer and also neurodivergent is that you actually have two masks on. So you have the, I'm a neurotypical person, I can complete tasks on a reasonable time. But then you also have like, oh, I got to, you know, act more straight. I got to act more towards like the heteronormative, uh, you know, things that I'm supposed to be expecting to talk about. Like I, I work for the New York state government and I worked in a super conservative, like if you look up the 2016 election map, uh, I'm from this like center red mass that is basically in like Queens County. Like it's not, it's, you can't miss it. It's literally like right there, <laughs> right in the middle of it. Big ass and, temple. Yeah, yeah basically. <laughs> Hopefully no one back home no is going to listen to this. Yeah. No offense to them. <laughs> it's okay. Um, and so. <laughs> I mean, I picture is that. like how uh, everybody from Staten Island would give, um, what was it Colin <laughs> Jost from SNL? They would just like trash him <laughs> all the time. <laughs> You're going to get added to like the shit list. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Oh, well, <laughs> I'm not too worried about it. And so like, I couldn't even, I didn't even feel comfortable like talking about being gay or being queer at work, at work things, at like work events. You, you just had try so hard to just put up those walls and those barriers because it's a protection thing. It's so, it's more so of protecting myself and my mental health than it ever was in you know actually interacting with these people because I have to interact with them either way right mm -hmm. and so like even I don't think it, it wasn't until we moved up to the capital that I even had a picture of my fiance on my desk because like you never know what person's just going to walk into my office and just start going off about something ridiculous or something super homophobic and in those moments like I've always just had to just like take like a deep breath and just like be like I'm sorry that you feel like that like I'm I I don't know what else to tell you we live in New York like if you I hope don't you get like these, spiders I mean that too but like if you don't like it like we live in New York yeah I'm <laughs> It's like when they would call and at like complain about like the abortion stuff, like of an abortion bill. I'd be like, well, when's the last time you've needed to be in that kind of situation where you've considered getting one? And they'd be like grumpy old men. Oh, I would never. And I'm like, OK, so this clearly doesn't have an effect on your life if you're never going to have to deal with it. Like, mind your business, like what people are doing in their in their house with their in their doctor's office nobody's business like leave these people alone and so like you put up all these walls for so long and like you never know like when you're switching work environments you'll never know if like is this an actual safe place is this a safe place where these people are going to be respectful of not just me as a queer person but also like other queer people like I had a former boss told me that um using they them in a sentence was uh i think it was he said it was like too nuanced or too new age or some some ridiculous boomer language basically because in an email he would write like not not knowing what the person's gender was he slash she dude just write they you're using less letters like right I, right and he just he said something so stupid and i just was so mad about it. And this was even before like I had come to like terms with my pronouns and like, we'll get into all of that stuff when I dive into my notes, but like, it's even just like, okay, it's one thing for you to say this to me in an email. Right. But are you talking about like this, like when you're out in public where other people can hear you? Cause like, probably. I'm not going to make a huge <laughs> deal out of the, yeah. Right. Like <laughs> you probably are. And so like, the more I just sat with this, like staring at this email, the more I'm just like, mm, we can't do this. It's like, we're in the 2020s by now. Like you can't, we can't talk like this. Like, especially like people that work for the New York government, right? We can't just let these things slide. And I said something to my boss and I was like, Hey, 
I'm not going to make a big deal and like actually complain, but I'm going to complain to you because like this isn't cool and like you can't talk like this. And like, I don't really care if he thinks that it's like a new age thing. I don't want somebody outside of our circle to hear this and then think through all these connections that like that there's a problem here. And like, I don't want a problem, but I'll cause one if I need to. Like, I can identify as a fucking problem real quick when needed, basically. And so, like, that was basically resolved. But at the same time, like, you never know kind of, like, who you're talking to on the other side of the phone call or, like, the casework that I would be handling. And, like, I've been in a lot of different uh, work workplace situations where, like, there are people screaming homophobic and transphobic things. Like I was at a, a community board meeting back home and it was, it was a huge meeting. Like I I'll send you the YouTube link later because just to see it's how ridiculous. YouTube. Oh, it's on YouTube. Yeah. I'll send it when to it you makes guys. it to YouTube. That's Is it a- better or worse than the community board meetings in what we do in the shadows or parks and rec. <laughs> oh no! Definitely not as funny as Parks Parks and Recs, but definitely it's. I don't know that other thing that you just said, but at the same time, oh, like, you gotta watch it. Colin Robinson so gets boners by watching the drama at like the town council meetings on in Staten Island. Actually, <laughs> I'm sure that there are some people that get boners <laughs> to these meetings, but um... oh, especially when they're talking about <laughs> queer rights and somebody's. Oh no! You know... It wasn't even. It wasn't even about that. It was the oh. person. This person went up to the mic to speak their concerns and the guy sitting right behind them in the auditorium was standing there just well sitting there like just screaming these like horrible things so this person standing up and talking to a room of prop like hunt like at least a hundred and something people like we're talking about a huge auditorium and just like screaming these horrific things and I'm I'm sitting across the aisle from them sitting next to my boss also and I'm just sitting there and I'm getting more angry and more pissed off and at some point I was just like I can't do this anymore and I got up and I went to uh an NYPD sergeant that I knew that was standing in the back of the room and I was like hey I understand things are getting heated tonight and I'm all for people voicing their concerns but there's a guy sitting behind the mic that is screaming homophobic and transphobic things we're in a, we're actually, we were in my uh, Catholic high school, which was even funnier. I'm like, we're literally in a Catholic school right now. Can you please just go talk to this guy and just tell him to simmer down because I'm getting so angry. I'm going to have to do something about it. And like, we both don't want that. And the sergeant went over and like said something to this guy and the, the guy tried to give like the sergeant like back talk. And he's like, let's go buddy, get out of here. And like, I'm pretty sure he got kicked out. And, like, that's what happens. Like, you play stupid games, you win stupid prizes. Like, you just that, wanted to quote Taylor Swift. I mean, that too. <laughs> you already know. But, like, that too. You fuck around and you find out sometimes. And it is what it is. And it's like moments like that where, like, I tell people, I'm like, being an ally is a verb. Like, you have to actively be doing things like that and making sure that queer people can have space in public places in order to be an ally like being an ally is a verb you have to actively be doing things that help progress our community forward instead of just standing by and just like letting all these things happen because everyone everyone else around him didn't say anything nobody was saying something to him that's so crazy Uh, it's I mean again classic on where I come from so no real big shocker there but it's things like that where like I'm literally at work, like I'm on the clock, I'm sitting next to my boss and I still have to put down part of my armor to just go protect this kid that I didn't even know. I don't I don't know where he's from. I don't know how they're doing now. I hope they're doing OK, but I just felt so bad that like this kid is just trying to read off a statement that he has and he's just getting yelled horrible things at like and like when I, are we tolerant of that type of behavior like ever right in yeah. other circumstances well, only yeah in, yeah only in that certain that yeah you yeah. Know, realm will people kind of like let it go yeah and um, then so like this basically comes from the fact that like 
this is why like people don't always come out you know like I Mm -hmm. dated boys in high school I personally never understood the concept of coming out because it's not like I came home one day and just announced hey mom and dad I have a boyfriend I wasn't doing that in high school when I was dating boys and so when I started dating girls exclusively I feel like I didn't really get it like I'm like I'm just dating somebody else like this is this is it. And it's basically to reclaim some of that power of just like, hey, I exist. I'm here. This is my life. And if you have a problem with it, like, there's a door. Like, you know, I'm no longer, some people would say that it's intolerant of the intolerance, but it's just like, I, I'm, Ugh. that, yeah, yeah. Like, I'm, <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm intolerant of people that are straight up assholes. Like, excuse me. Sorry pardon me for like having standards for how people should act and just again just mind your business stay in your own lane and you know well it's no different than i mean the the concept of political correctness that people will throw around all the time Mm. i'm like no it's it's just not being an asshole you've just got like a whole group of people that's like hey this term really just rubs me the wrong way can you can you just say this instead right no one is (laughs) like stepping on your rights because they're saying hey that's just like a shitty thing to say or alternatively like please stop looking at me and thinking about what my genitals look like like that is a weird like when you break it down like I've had to have that conversation with at least one of my uncles where I'm like in what world would that like because somebody didn't shave their legs you were like well now I need to know what their genitals look like like what that's a weird connection and like here's the thing all of this is so yeah Yeah. all of this stuff is so deep rooted though because if you actually look back into like especially like here in new york right i feel like one of the things that i came across during some research that i probably did during undergrad is that new york actually used to have like a clothing law right so like you couldn't be wearing uh, i think it was three items of the opposite sex gender or you could be arrested. And that is actually what a lot of the people that were getting arrested um, when- Oh, like Marsha P. Johnson and all that. Yes, during that time frame and the civil rights, a lot of those people were getting arrested because of this clothing law that New York had. It's like, uh, you know, it kind of gives off that same vibe that you're seeing in like all of these other states across America, where it's just like more about how you look and what your appearance is than like anything else. And it's just, it's one of those things that these things are so deep rooted into our systems already. And we've been spending decades to unlearn them. Like, no wonder why older people say they don't get it it's just like you saw these people when you were growing up and you threw them in jail or let them die or both yeah and it's just one of these things you wonder why queer people didn't exist it's because they died or you murdered them or they didn't feel safe enough to come out to you so they just left you behind like all these different things and like that's also part of the problem is that they don't see the connection between this didn't exist back in my day versus like they did, they just were hiding from you. Yeah, and- antibiotics also didn't exist at one point. <laughs> that doesn't mean <laughs> that we, like, and, nobody and can take antibiotics. Thing. And then here's the other thing. Oh, so many kids today have ADHD. Back in my day, these things didn't exist. Yes, they did. They yeah, just- you just beat the shit out of those kids like my mother was literally tied to a chair in kindergarten tied until she wet her pants for the full day because she wouldn't sit still and like was sleeping through nap time like they'd have nap time at noon or whatever and then she'd sleep the rest of the school day and her teacher like at the end of the year was like oh she's gonna have to repeat the grade because she missed the second half of every school day and they were like did you think that maybe you should have told us that she was having sleep problems like in I don't know fucking October like (laughs) like what the fuck so like it worked out because her birthday's in September so she was kind of like on that cusp Mm -hmm. where she could have done either anyway but it was just one of those things where they were like why would you have you tied her to a seat so first of all she wet her pants but like that was the solution to somebody being hyperactive and so they were like well I guess we got to put her in as many sports as possible because this 
girl just won't stop moving. And she did. She like, she was the only girl playing little league baseball because they didn't have softball teams. And like, it was the kind of thing where they were like, whatever we can do to get this girl to move so that she's tired and will, I don't know, not ADHD be awake all night and will actually go to sleep. Like, so she can stay awake during the school day. It's like those types of things. That's what they did back then. Like, and especially if you were a boy, you for sure got hit. You and you kept getting hit. Like it wasn't, it wasn't an option. There was no alternative treatment unless you were, you know, dealing with some other comorbidity that was extremely severe. And then you end up in Willowbrook. I mean, you know how that worked out. Yeah. 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 No, it's uh it's this like thought that everybody's like way overly sensitive. It's like, no, it's just like giving a shit about what other people are dealing with. That's all. That's yeah, all just is. have like a, a drop of some empathy. Right. To just I would say that it's almost bucket. less, it takes, it's like less sensitive for me to be like, yeah, go live your life. I don't care. Like yeah. you're not hurting me. So like fully don't care. Yeah. I will only care if you like flash your genitals to my child, in which case, yes, that is an inappropriate drag. Or ask my power. child about their genitals. Like right. it, it's <laughs> the, the, um, the party of freedom is Un- very concerned. Only their freedom, though. That's right. the thing, right? right. Freedom and- for Christians, yeah. 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 Like, As I if, mean, like, a new Duggar documentary didn't just come out, so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, I mean, <laughs> not freedom for conversations you want to have with your doctor or, or medical decisions you want to make with your family or. No, no, no. That would be whatever silly. Whatever it is. That would be silly. So. I would like if, Yeah. And it, see, this is the problem. Um, the South generally is um, problematic start to finish. However, they do have the word y'all. And I really wish we could get that one on board up here because I feel like such a poser when I say it. But like, at the same oh, I time, give myself douche chills when I use yes, it. But like, but I, know, I, don't, I don't so care helpful. though. Like, it's <laughs> the all perfect all. word. So, yeah, it like, is. <laughs> it is. It definitely is. And I so saw I'll use that a lot too. But especially like when I'm in a work meeting and like I'm talking to like I'm walking into a conference room and I'm now meeting with like seven people. I'm like, hey, folks, how's it going? Mm -hmm. Because, again, I don't know anybody in this room. But if the minute somebody hears me using gender inclusive language, then they're like, oh, okay, this is a safe place. Like I do feel welcomed here. I do Mm -hmm. feel like. I'm being recognized and I feel like that's something that is completely o- almost always overlooked of just it's not just so much about just being there to receive the information but making sure that people feel welcome to tell these things mm-hmm. and that's actually one of the uh, points that Jamie included in in their post of basically like um the fears of rejection because you know who doesn't fear rejection more than a bunch of neurodivergent people <laughs> and getting rejected in those types of way like feeling like i can't talk about my partner or my spouse at work like that's a whole layer to it will me having a picture of my engagement photo on my desk will that cause a problem Mm -hmm. like there's just so many of these like tiny layers that are basically like weaved into being queer being in a workplace environment but then also having to deal with like my brain chemistry constantly being out of whack it's just like like the whole concept is just like man the idea of being rejected just makes me want to like just stay in the closet even longer and I think that's part of what kept me in the closet for so long is that I was so afraid of like my family not being accepting. Like I come from a huge Irish family. So like, I'm like, "Mm, I don't know how this is going to work. Like I just won't talk about it because if I don't talk about it and I just start showing up with a girl to all these events, they'll put two and two together and I won't have to explain anything. And like, you know, my family's always been like super great about it. But then it was also like, I went to a Catholic high school. I went to a Catholic university. Talk about two places where being queer and and or being neurodivergent, not really the most accepting, welcoming places to be. And then you start growing this like internalized homophobia of just mm-hmm. like, 
I got to just shove this shit down as so far down that it'll just never come up and I'll just basically be able to ignore it for as long as possible, which I personally think that is so ADHD of just like, let me just avoid this thing that might cause problems. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Is it a pile of laundry or is it your um, gender identity? And I mean, I mean, is it old (laughs) male? (laughs) Is it boomer in the workplace? You know? Yes. M A I L. That a male person, male carrier, has brought to my house. (laughs) I do think like work is especially tricky. Um, You know, family, you can kind of get away with seeing your family occasionally work Mm -hmm. it's like i have to not only see these people regularly i have to talk to these people regularly i have to problem solve with these people regularly i also need there to be mutual trust so that i'm entrusted to take care of things i can delegate things so i think work i know like i have talked to my team of people about adhd um and they know about the podcast and it's something we like joke about a lot um, because I'm not the only one with it. So it's like a running joke. Like one of us be like, Hey, can you make sure you send me an email? Cause you know, ADHD and we'll kind of laugh about it, but, um, it's definitely uh, a safe space <laughs> within our team. And then outside of the team, it's like, I don't think other people would, I don't want to plant the seeds of mistrust thinking I'm not going to be able to handle something or take care of something, or it's going to make somebody uncomfortable. I think I, I know personally, I tend to be the person that when off color comments are made. Um, generally, I think people don't make them in front of me. But Except for I, that can relate, I can relate to that. <laughs> people stop people stop making inappropriate comments in front of me because I'll make some type of sound effect and or just immediate impulsive response. Like, oof. Yeah. You really just yeah. said that. Like I've ooh. literally gone like, ooh. Yeah. I don't really know if that's something we want to be saying out loud. So I do think people probably (laughs) tend to be more careful in the language they choose in front of me, which I am fine with. If that's what it takes for you to like think twice, because the whole lesson here is like, if you have to think twice about it, just don't. Like if if anything sets off a bell in your head where you're like, ooh, Mm -hmm. just don't. Um, But it's definitely like a full avoidance. Mm-hmm. Don't bring it up to people. Don't talk about it. And except and for like so my like, little safe space within my team. Yeah. So like some of my some of my coworkers knew that I was dating girl, you know, prior to getting engaged, like that I was in a queer relationship because again, it's it's a nuanced thing. Like if you if I don't think that you're going to get it, I'm probably not going to tell you in the first place. But then, so there are moments where like, I'd have to go to like, like a senior center, right? I'm in a men's button up shirt, skinny pants, like probably a pair of Vans. The amount of little ladies that would tell me about their cute grandson, right? And so, and I'm just like- Never (laughs) fails. And I would just be like- I mean, such a sweet suggestion though. Oh, (laughs) very sweet. Adorable. (laughs) And definitely the most busted looking grandsons. Oh, Oh, some of them were cute. Like they'd had photos on their phone and I'm just like, in my head, I'm like, oh, that'd be a cute kid for my sister. Like, I don't need dating Um, help, but like- (laughs) Finding don't, a good don't m- trust those sons okay they I, probably yeah, have a drug problem like, or <laughs> or yeah. are also gay and <laughs> not oh, looking to be like, set up oh, by grandma that's the Likely. plot twist yes <laughs> yeah, yeah. like yeah. grandma can you can you we've talked about this can you not or they were on next and they have that <laughs> crazy frog hpv and <laughs> And so it's, it's, it's like moments like that, where it's just like, oh, I'm way too busy with work and school right now. Cause mm. like, they'd know, like we'd gotten to like know each other after like a handful of months. Right. And they'd be like, oh, like how's school going? How's work? And are you seeing anyone? And I'm like, ha ha ha. I don't have time to date. Don't be silly. I'm, I'm way too so busy. busy. <laughs> I'm way too independent to be tied down right now. Even though like as a Sagittarius, I'm, I am very like monogamous in that sense where like, that's like my one Sagittarius trait that I like just 
can't get behind. I'm like, I don't know who says that because all the Sagittariuses that I know are so clingy and so Mm -hmm. just like one person (laughs) kind of deal that I'm like, I don't know who started this rumor, but it's definitely wrong. Like, right. Like I enjoy doing things. Like I don't want somebody to tell me my schedule, but like, I just also only want to have plans with one somebody. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so it's just, it's one of those things where it's just a constant hiding and masking and having to put up this charade of, I'm totally following this heteronormative agenda that has just been pushed on me for my entire existence. And here I am in my mid 20s living my best queer life, but yet still struggling to find that workplace life balance in a sense of like how can I fully be fulfilled if I'm not living my best out life and I feel like that's the other thing that I feel like always gets jumbled into like a lot of like the pride inspirational quotes where it's just like if if your safety is at risk or you don't feel safe you are not obligated to explain your existence to anybody. Your existence on this planet is enough evidence for you to be here. And I feel like that's the other thing that also gets like really mixed in. Cause like not every workplace is inviting, not every family's welcoming. Like I was on a date in New York city when I was like first coming out and you know, New York city, right. I'm literally in midtown and I'm on a date. I go to kiss the girl that I'm on the date with. And I swear to God, this guy came this close to us. Like if this is my, this, this is my, me standing on this New York city sidewalk, this guy got like way too close. Like literally we're talking like within two feet of us. And he just started screaming these absurd homophobic things to us. And I'm like, bruh, you're lucky I'm on a date because if I saw you doing this to somebody else, I definitely would have shoved you onto the ground and like kick some dirt into your eyeballs. Cause like, who do you think you are on this like moral high ground that you can just approach somebody and be that aggressive and invade personal space just because you feel some type of way and because you're upset about people existing. Yeah, exactly. Garrett, your face was my face. Like <laughs> it's-, it's just such a male entitlement yeah. too to just invade mm-hmm. somebody's space like that let alone all the aggression that goes with it but like but also to invade such an intimate moment and then so then the, there are other things other other crazy things that just happen where I was out at a bar with um this girl that I was dating with some of my work co-workers right people that I thought were inclusive people in a sense of okay I can bring my girlfriend at you know my ex-girlfriend now but girlfriend at the time out to you know staff bar night we'll go out we'll have a fun time so I'm at this bar and some random guy sitting down the bar sees me and my girlfriend he starts trying to talk to us then I'm outside I was smoking a cigarette he comes outside oh is that you and is that your girlfriend yes that's me and my that's my girlfriend oh well you know you guys should you girls should come home to with me and i'll show you a good t- yeah yeah you can only imagine where this whole conversation was going mm-hmm. I'm like, no i'm good been there done that got the postcards glad i found a detour route like i'm good guy like it's fine i go finish my cigarette go back inside he then comes over to us again and he put his he touched my uh girlfriend's arm like her forearm. I swear to God, I grabbed this kid by the collar of his shirt so quickly and rem- and like shoved him across the bar. And I was like, listen, you don't touch other people. My hands are on you right now because you're touching my girlfriend and I have a fucking problem with that. So learn to keep your hands to yourself or we're going to have a problem. Did anybody of my coworkers step in other than to physically remove me from this guy? No. Was there a girl sitting at the bar defending this random stranger on how he was just flirting and having a good time? And I was like, not when he's disrespected me and my girlfriend multiple times. Like, no, no. Also, like, what a Chad thing to do of being like, oh, lesbians (laughs) only exist for, you know, uh, three way fun from the guy who probably wouldn't know a clitoris if it lived on his nose. 
<laughs> let alone like Lynch. what to do with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and so it's like yeah. moments like that where it's just like man these like it's not even like it's not I don't even know if I'd describe it as like a microaggression because it it happens so quickly that's a and macro so, aggression <laughs> well it's yeah it's, like and I, then like I became the bad guy because I put mm-hmm. my hands on him again impulsive thinking not realizing oh did he have a weapon did he have yeah. got other friends at the bar I'm not thinking about those things. I just went in full blown like defense mode of just like, Mm. I'm going to remove this guy from my immediate area or I will have to physically harm him. Like you can't just invade people's bubbles and then be pissed off when they're like, why are you being an asshole? Or like, you know, Mm -hmm. get all defensive because you're acting a certain type of way. And so it's things like that that just make queer people want to only go to gay bars where they feel safe or like not always go to work functions because the people that are at these work functions don't know how to be an ally in those moments because like any of my gay friends were there any of like my lifetime friends would have been right behind me ready to fucking lay this guy out Mm -hmm. but people that I thought were my friends that I worked with we're just like, I don't know why you got so mad. He didn't even do anything. Or even it to like a- be in a group and have somebody follow you outside when you go out for a cigarette is wild that nobody was like, I'm going to go out with her because I don't know who this man is that just followed her outside. Yeah. Yeah. That is um, un- like, yeah. Yeah. That's don't do don't let your friends do that <laughs> like yeah, at the very yeah. least like yeah. fuck yeah. yeah like that yeah, is uh and like even on like a co-worker base level like if somebody from your group is then going to go off briefly send them with a teammate like don't go off and just let your person just go off and just oh they'll be fine sure totally. they might be fine but they also might not be fine and like yeah you know i'm not really You know, like that dude was like maybe like a couple of inches shorter than me. Like I didn't really see him as a threat. I went to school in New York City. Like a guy like this that I'm just encountering randomly at the bar. I'm not really too worried about him. But at the same time, I also wasn't thinking about did he have a weapon? Did he have friends? Like all the other normal scenarios that I would think at. Like when I'm walking through like a parking garage or something. You know, all those other things that you're supposed to be alert of go right out the window once I'm I'm feeling immediately threatened like all of those Mm -hmm. you know reasonable thought processes are just gone because I gotta just do what I gotta do to protect myself and whatever else happens we'll figure it out and I feel like that's another big part of being queer and neurodivergent is that you never know which impulses are the right ones to act on because I might just be defending myself, but that probably would be seen as like impulsive because I didn't really think about all of the consequences that could have come after that. And I feel like that's another, just another whole layer of the whole concept in general. Of and that kind of like world that, exists. Right. And the justice sensitivity layover too, like, mm-hmm. There was one morning I was walking into work and got catcalled by a guy in a bus stop. And I go into work early. It's like seven something in the morning and I'm by myself and there's nobody else around. And I just got, it was like a zero to 60. Like I just got so angry. I turned, I was like, fuck you and flipped the guy off. And then I walked into work and I was like, I am by myself. <laughs> like, yes, people know what time I'm supposed to be to work, but like, that's probably something that wasn't the safest move that I've made but I was so angry so it was like this really bad combination of like an (laughs) impulsive reaction and that like just a sensitivity where it was like that's the wrong that's it is 20 I don't know at the time 2019 it's 2019 like we're not catcalling anymore get your shit together and was like "Mm, maybe that wasn't the best move (laughs) Yeah. And I feel like I do that so many, so many other times in life where like, I'm already thinking, like, I'm not thinking about how I'm already acting. I came across this good article. um, I think it was like a medium article and somebody was writing um, 
basically on how they're they were always perceived as like the loud gay person in the office not recognizing that they also have adhd so even though like a lot of like the <laughs> oh, uh, the you know like the what's the word i'm looking for all of like the impulsive things are just being like super loud and like you know somewhat labeled like obnoxious um not me and garrett getting yelled at for that at work i mean yeah yeah never never (laughs) once in my life and so it's one of those things and then getting mad that we got yelled at for it yeah and never once yeah and so what people (laughs) thought was him just being like a really annoying like being seen as like the really annoying gay guy it was actually his adhd that made him super loud and like I consider like outgoing and almost like just like really just constantly having the gears going. Mm -hmm. It's because this kid had ADHD and it's not just because he's like a loud gay kid. Like that's not what it was. You guys completely missed the fact that he was ADHD or I don't, I shouldn't say he because I don't remember their pronouns, but so they didn't acknowledge the fact that this person had ADHD and that person didn't feel comfortable enough to talk about their ADHD because they were already seen as like the loud, gay, obnoxious one, which again, then just another layer of the internalized homophobia where like, I can't have all of my gears spinning at the same time. Otherwise I'm seen in a negative portrayal of like the loud, obnoxious, gay, when really it's just my ADHD and I just happen to be gay on top of that. And yeah. how how much does this like uh, caricature that they have of me uh, lend itself to being vulnerable and telling people like, hey, like this is something that I deal with, something that I have a hard time with. Like I definitely go around it and I'll say, you know, if I if we could do it this way, that'll work a lot better for me instead of being like, uh, my brain will refuse to do that. So can we try it? <laughs> I just have to like offer an alternative and kind of go around it. Yeah. Around the block to get next door because sometimes that's the only way I think to get people to work with you without being uh, dismissive mm-hmm. of something. Yeah. yeah. And I feel like that's why it's always been easier for me to talk about my ADHD. Cause like, I really don't care if you think that it exists or whether or not you think my medication is working or just like any of these other negative thoughts that you could have about my ADHD. Cause like, let's be real. I've already had those thoughts. I've already felt bad enough about myself jokes on you i'm meaner to me yeah exactly (laughs) though like that is part of it you think you can bully me (laughs) you should have heard the comments my ninth grade english teacher wrote on my report card like (laughs) jokes on you it's like a meme of uh ben stiller in dodgeball where he's like oh you think i know that you know that we know that i know you know (laughs) Yes. <laughs> like, yeah. And so it's kind of at the point where like, I'm, I'm so yeah. secure in talking about that because it, it is my everyday life. Like I wish there was just like a little tiny switch in my brain and then I could just be like normal, you know, and just be able to act appropriate at all times and like know to pick up on social cues and like all of these other things my brain just doesn't work like that. And it's taken a lot of work and a lot of therapy for me to be like, I'm not going to put myself in triggering moments because I did the work. I've been to therapy. I took, I did all the steps that I needed to like, be like, yeah, I am an ADHD adult. Like what of it? I have an extremely high executive functioning score. Do I have an extremely low frustration level? Yes. You know, like, (laughs) oh, yeah, I'm on like, I'm on very opposite ends here. So like my problem solving top notch, the feelings I have when I can't figure out the problem, it, it explains why I used to punch holes in sheet rocks growing up because I couldn't get those feelings out in a productive way Mm -hmm. that I would just resort to straight up frustration and anger. And then that's when a hole gets punched in a wall. And I didn't know these things until I got my evaluation. I, you know, I was in therapy and I did all the work to be like, oh yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, the <laughs> depression that I was feeling as like a preteen. Oh, it's actually linked to the fact that you're neurodivergent and you were going through puberty and all of these things changed throughout your entire body that you had no idea about. And like, shout out to your that episode that you guys did, because I never put those two and two together. Like, oh, I was sad and depressed and, you know, miserable when I was a teenager. It wasn't because I wasn't trying hard enough or that I wasn't doing enough or being enough. It was just my body's brain chemistry just going off the wire, basically. And there was nothing I could have really done to prevent that, let alone like stop what was happening, essentially. Mm -hmm. And it's like also like in that time where it was just like, you know, I graduated high school in 2010, like up until high school and like beginning of undergrad, like one of the worst words that somebody could say to me would literally be to call me a dyke, like to my face. And like, that's something, you know, like being, being called gay as a slur was something that, you know, Hillary Duff worked very hard to get people to stop doing that. But it's those moments like that where, again, like my impulsiveness would come out. Like I got into so many fist fights when I was in middle school because these kids would call me like a dyke or call me gay and I'd instantly just fly off the handle because like I just couldn't handle that somebody was thinking that about me, that that was the worst thing that somebody could say about me. But then also I wasn't even thinking about what if it's actually true. And I feel like that's also where like a lot of like my internalized homophobia came from was growing up. That was like the worst thing that you could call somebody. Mm -hmm. And I was definitely the kid that was getting in trouble because the second some kid was mouthing off to me, he'd catch these hands. Like I couldn't stop myself. It was just the, okay, I'm now going to try to be beat you up because and it's so You're hard using language and I don't know how to control myself, but this yeah. was also like pre-diagnosis where like my impulsive and lack of self-control wasn't even a thing we were questioning because I don't know why, but at the same time, it was because I did something wrong and it was never about what the kids said. Right. And like, I feel like that's also what just always pissed me off growing up because I wasn't, how I defend myself isn't just to verbally harass you back I'm gonna literally make you shut up because that's the only way I know how to make it stop um yeah I more subscribe to the um say something truthful but devastating club um she certainly that's me does. now Real that's me current <laughs> like do you Real need a hug at it in, a mid in middle school I was really good at just like cutting somebody to their quick but um, I think also, you know, in middle school, your world is so small. So, you know, yeah, at the time, I mean, not that it's any better now for somebody to call you gay and as a slur or in a derogatory way, but you, it's a lot easier, you know, as you grow up and as you get through that part of your life to see that like, oh, this is just this person probably, first of all, they probably won't think about this ever again, the person who's saying this, but also like, like this moment doesn't define you, even though it feels like it does. And so it's just so hard though, when you're little and you're full of big emotions, especially going through puberty when like your emotions and your brain like is too big for your body, like, and everything's just trying to balance out. It's really hard to keep that perspective um, in the moment. And, you know, as we've talked about before, it's very easy for, people with ADHD to get misdiagnosed, it's usually people of color, but to get misdiagnosed with a conduct disorder rather than to be misdiagnosed with ADHD, because you would fly off the handle and, you know, let, fight with somebody. And, and well, that's, you know, that's a behavioral issue. That's not a focus issue. That's not a school issue. Um, so it's, it's the kind of thing where it's like, well, you know, they're just, you know, then, um, I know you've said it before, Garrett, but it's like that's how that kid ends up being called a bad kid, not just mm -hmm. a kid with like I was a, a bad disability. kid. Oh no, I was a bad kid. I feel like I got labeled as like a bad kid like once in every school that I went to, and it kind of just stuck with uh, like with me the entire time. But yet nobody put 
two and two together to like maybe like re-diagnose me to I don't know look into why I'm not getting services like I'm a full believer that I basically just fell through the cracks like there was just some disconnect that like my parents didn't know um how to handle it because they're also immigrants so like there's that layer where like my parents probably didn't fully understand how to resolve it but mm-hmm. then also like there was no school intervention at at any point i at least not that mm-hmm. i remember in like later years like middle school through high school and it's one of those things where like kids like that just end up falling through the cracks and it's because they don't want to show like not literally show up but they don't want to do the work because you're just a boring teacher like i had a horrible ninth grade english teacher who wrote in like horrific like script like catholic school teacher script but then would photocopy she would then photocopy her own handwriting and hand those out as the test papers and i'm yeah. like i can't read this That's and ridiculous. she took yeah she took that as me being like disrespectful and a bad kid but i'm just like i just don't know what you're writing so i can't read it or like I'm taking a New York State Regents exam, again, sitting by the window because we're in alphabetical order. I've also just been, so, you're so conditioned at a point where like you have to ask permission for everything. Like you mm-hmm. can't just stand up and do anything. So I ask, hey, can I just close the blinds? Not to move my seat, nothing crazy. Can I just close the blinds? I don't want to be able to see outside while I'm taking this test. You should be able to control yourself and not look out the window. Well, yeah, I should, but here we are. I like, literally fuck. got yelled at in like fourth grade because I noticed it was snowing outside in October and pointed it out. But she like barked at me and I'm like, I'm nine years old and it's snowing. Like I'm allowed to be excited also, about that. Snow is gorgeous and it's always pretty when it happens. Like, yes. yes. Just enjoy the fucking snow. God damn. We live in a place with seasons for who knows how long. Yeah, and- <laughs> yeah. Liter- literally though literally <laughs> god damn all right so this is running long so we're gonna cut it here but we will be back next week with more of this conversation with sarah and the queer slash neurodivergent experience um in the meantime though um we are going to again remind you to please vote for us um starting july 1st nominate us for the people's choice podcast awards the link to do that will be in the show notes for this episode. It'll also be um, all over our Instagram page. And um, I'll try to remember, we'll see, to put a link to that on our website. Um, but in the meantime, make sure you're, you're following us on Instagram at the bar is ankle high. If you want any merch, you can go to bit.ly slash ankle high merch. Do you want to scream? Billy. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> never gets old um and uh do we have anything else am i forgetting something oh give us five star reviews because we're cute yeah and um i think that's it i think that's it i don't have my list in front of me uh join our patreon oh yeah (laughs) (laughs) at patreon.com slash bars ankle hi yes because um starting uh, our first episode in August on uh, August 3rd, um, Anklets and Limbo Champions will both be getting ad-free episodes because we're pretty sure that we won't be able to do Dysfunction Junction episodes with a new um, baby blueberry around. So uh, if while Garrett's on maternity leave, at least, we'll be expanding the ad-free episodes. So make sure you sign up if you hate hearing ads. And... <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that's it. I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. So in the meantime, um, I don't know. How would you end it, Sarah? I guess just an overall Pride Month message is that being an ally is a verb. If you're not helping, chances are somebody around you is hurting. So just keep that in mind as we progress through pride month and the rest of the year because after pride comes wrath so brace yourselves for that and that's basically it. and never forget the bar's ankle high bye <laughs>